Hello, everyone. Dr. John, my husband, we are live. So now everyone can see us and you. And so to be kind to my introverted husband, we're going to go like this. Does that make you feel better, babe? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Just for tonight, just for tonight. Uh, first off, if everybody could please subscribe and like our podcast, it helps us so much. We are delving into crimes where we truly want to be able to help and by supporting us and liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, we hope that in turn it'll help the crimes that we're investigating and have investigated. So thank you so much, everyone, for showing your support. Dr. John rarely makes an appearance anymore here on YouTube. Most of his episodes are on Patreon. Uh, patreon.com slash hidden true crime. So if you like what Dr. John has to say tonight, head over to Patreon, join, and there are several episodes a month that we do that you can listen on your RSSS feed anywhere where podcasts are listened to. And we have a couple of new ones on their way as well. And we just covered the case of a woman whose uh, child died during an exorcism. That was our latest one where Dr. John shared his thoughts. Lastly, um, well, not lastly, there's always more, but before we begin, uh, and we're going to discuss tonight as a special TGIF, usually uh, we do not discuss other crimes, and again, usually uh, Dr. John is not here on TGIF, it's a rare appearance, but we have been following the Gabby Petito case, or Dr. John, I should say, is the expert when it comes to the Gabby Petito, Brian Laundry case. For those that are unfamiliar, our new listeners, Dr. John, uh, five different videos. Dr. John was on the news, on Fox National News, when Gabby was missing. And they asked him his thoughts of a 20-minute live. That link is in, the uh, is in the description of this video, but I hope my mods might post it as well. And there he called it. He said exactly what it was when, they, when the anchor asked him, but there was so much love between him and the videos. You said, no, I, I don't see what you see. And he shared some really, really interesting observations there. The next day, September 18th, 2021, we decided to look at and analyze the Moab body cam footage of Gabby Petito. While many body language experts or other people didn't see what we saw, we made it very clear that Dr. John saw that uh, Gabby Petito was in a domestic violent relationship with Brian Laundrie. That was while she was still listening. Again, both of those are in the subscription of this video, as well as a few other videos that John and I did when it came to Gabby Petito. So of course, when the news came down tonight, I could not do TGIF without my husband and co-host tonight, since we were going to be discussing the confession, as well as the suicide note of Brian Laundrie that just was released a seven page handwritten note. It's heavy. It's interesting. And we've received a lot of requests. So thank you, babe, for being here. Sure. Yep. Happy to be here. Smile. That's what people <laughs> tell women to do, right? Smile. <laughs> how, can, no. how can I smile when I'm dealing with such grim topics? True. True. Um, there's, there's nothing in here that's, that's uh, smile worthy. Yes, there maybe, are. Maybe there, a little bit. I'll tell you what there is. There are hidden gems, our hidden gems in the chat tonight. Right now, there are nearly 400 of them at this moment. People are thanking you. They're grateful for you. And he's not looking at the comments, only I am, so he's not distracted. So that is to be grateful for. So, Can you hear John? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. People are saying they love you. So that you can smile about, right, babe? <laughs> True. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so do you want me to, to start in talking about this letter? It's it's a really fascinating suicide note, I guess, would be one way to describe it, or goodbye letter. I'm not quite sure if that would be accurate. But um, one thing that really stands out in this letter, the, the first time I read it, was the absence of some of the stuff you just mentioned, the absence of any conflict in their relationship, the absence of any violence. There's actually no mention of his grief. He mentions his family's grief briefly, but he doesn't talk about his grief. He doesn't talk about his emotions. He doesn't talk about sadness. 
right? So there's there's so much here that's not in the letter that I thought that was really interesting. That in some ways, um, this letter I think is is less an apology and more of a public plea to um, kind of accept his version of events or to, to, to dismiss what he did as an accident. So um, I think it's interesting in the sense that this, a lot of this or some of this is about impression management and him trying to sway public, public opinion to some degree. I don't think he ever anticipated that people would be so fascinated and obsessed by um, Gabby's disappearance. Uh, and so I think he was probably just shocked that so many people were angry with him and so many people were angry that she was missing. And so I think this letter is really a response to that. And as we go through it, you know, we'll talk more about that. You're, I can't hear you. Thank you. Just wanted to share that uh, people are saying that you are, you are a gem that uh, one of our hidden gems says that she thinks you're the real gem. Larry and Kay Woodcock are here tonight with us and our moderators, Stephanie and Colette are here and uh, many others that we love and care for. So thank you everyone. Um, and thank you, Stephanie, for posting those links. I think what we'll do is, what do you think about this, babe, that I'll read the letter? Why don't we go through the letter together? Does that work? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and before we begin, another thing to smile about uh, is my shirt that I'm wearing because it came from our dear friend Lisa with Peppered with Leopard. So her link is in the description of this video as well. We're very grateful to partner with her and be her friend. So I did want to mention that too. So, all right. And uh, John, I always appreciate it. Let me pull up this letter when you're willing to talk about domestic violence. I've learned a lot from my own husband about domestic violence and research in the statistics. And so thank you. Thank you for being on here. A lot of the cases that hidden true crime covers are relevant to domestic violent and inter and um, intimate partner violence. So thank you. All right. This letter was clearly not just written, but it is Brian Laundrie's allegedly his goodbye letter, a confession letter, a suicide letter, many, many things. It's already been called just today. Gabby, I wish I was right at your side. I wish I could be talking to you right now. I'd be going over every memory we made, getting even more excited for the future. But we lost our future, and I cannot live without you. I've lost every day we could have spent together, every holiday. I'll never get to play with Illegible again. I'll never go hiking with TJ. I loved you more than anything. I can't bear to look at our photos to recall great times because it is why I cannot go on. Can we start with that? Um, yeah, why don't I have a little more on that first paragraph. Do you want to? Okay. Yeah, I'll keep going. Just, let's finish the, okay. Okay. When I close my, and you know what? I'll go to the actual letter. I tried to put it all here. I thought I copied and pasted it appropriately. You want, but me I to, really didn't. want me to finish that? Oh, do you have it there, babe? Yeah, I have it. I have the hard copy. When I close my eyes, I will think of laughing on the roof of the van, falling asleep to the side of illegible at the crystal geyser. I will always love you. That's so, what I was missing. Okay. So, I, you know, it, it's interesting because uh, the first paragraph, I think, is very nostalgic. Right, he's reflecting on the good times. He's reflecting on their past, um, but he's writing this after he killed her, right? So it's it's um, from a psychological standpoint, I think he's trying to negate a lot of the negative, obviously. And you know, the Moab, the Moab videos showed that there was a lot of negative. That they fought a lot, and I think that Gabby was actually in the process of leaving him, and so. Um, so this is this is pure nostalgia. This is you know him revisiting the good times, and and I think that's important for him. You know I'm sure that there were a lot of good times. So um, it's not totally irrelevant, but it's it's definitely kind of an attempt to whitewash their history 
to overlook the violence. You know, he's creating a little bit of a fantasy here. Um, he's trying to focus on what was rather than what actually happened and some of the problems they had. So it makes sense that he's starting with this because he's really kind of, he's setting the stage for us to kind of enter a little bit of his fantasy world, right? He's, he's bringing up this nostalgia so that now we're going to find the rest of his letter to be believable. Um, there's one particular line in here that really stands out to me. He says, but we lost our future. Yeah. We lost our future. No, we didn't lose our future. You lost the future, <laughs> right? Like, yes. I don't, you know, it's a really interesting sleight of hand because he's trying to, he's trying to shift blame from himself to Gabby there. Um, there's no we, right? There's him. He killed her. He's the one responsible for the loss of the future, but he's not taking responsibility for it there. So, so here you have in the first paragraph, at least you have this really nostalgic um, recollection of the past with this little line in there about the future being lost, you know, that somehow she was responsible for that. She wasn't, if she was, it's because she wanted to leave him. Um, and that probably resulted in some of the violence that led to her eventual death. Yeah, well said. The line that gets to me is also his selfishness. I've lost every day that we could have spent together. I'll never get to play with this, you know, them again. I'll never get to go hiking. I loved you more than anything. And so now I, you know, can't go on because my life, <laughs> I can't yeah. do A, B, and C, and D. Not that you won't be able to but I won't be able to. That's something that I noticed. Right, right. It, it shows how self-absorbed he is. But, you know, again, there's that sleight of hand about how we lost our future. Um, yeah, right. They're his memories. His memories are special, even though he was responsible for creating that situation. Um, he's trying to, he's trying to negate it. Right. Well said. I, I, I. Yeah, exactly. All right. I'll continue reading then. Thank you for finding that spot, John. Um, if you were reading Gab's journal, looking at photos from our life together, flipping through old cards, you wouldn't want to live a day without her. Knowing that every day you'll wake up without her, you would not want to wake up. I'm sorry to everyone this will affect. Gabby was the love of my life, but I know she was adored by many. I'm so very sorry to her family because I love them. I'd consider her younger siblings my best of friends. I am sorry to my family that this is a shock to them as well as a terrible grief. So the thing that really stands out here, you know, when I, when I read the second paragraph here, I was, I kind of had to pause. I was taken aback a little because if you read the first sentence of that second paragraph, if you were reading Gab's journal, looking at photos from our life together, flipping through old cards, you wouldn't want to live a day without her. He, who's he talking to, right? I mean, you could argue that he's talking to her family and maybe his family, but I think actually he's, he's talking to the public. I think he's actually, because so many people were invested in this case, I think he's actually making an argument um, to the public that she was, you know, quite loved and he loved her equally. And he's, he's, this is an attempt at impression management, right? He's, he's trying to influence yeah. public perception by saying everyone loved her, you know, you guys loved her. Um, and, you know, and so I kind of expect these types of letters just to be um, from a first person's point of view. In other words, I, I expect these letters to be, this is how I feel, this is why I did, you know, what from a first person perspective. And he's totally shifting, you know, he goes from first person in the first paragraph to, to you, to the public. And um, that's really fascinating to me because it shows me that there's definitely some self-esteem issues here. You know, that he's, he's extremely insecure. 
obviously about, you know, killing her, <laughs> but, um, but in general, you know, he's trying to make an appeal. He knows he's going to kill himself. So there's really nothing left to lose here. And yet here he is making this appeal to a broader audience about, you know, don't judge me. Um, I'm about to tell you the real story, right? So it's, it's fascinating because I, I don't think I've ever seen <laughs> a suicide note that switches from first person to second person and tries to make a, a public appeal, even though the person knows that they're going to kill themselves. So uh, he's trying to leave behind a positive impression here. Um, and he does it right away. He does it with this, these sentences about, you know, saying you, you wouldn't want to wake up. It's interesting. Right. Who he is talking to is a great question. You know, it's, it's interesting. Who is he writing to? They loved you as much, if not more than me. So at this point, I'm assuming the younger siblings, it's a new paragraph, but the last thing he said was her, her, well, no, it sounds like the public. He said, her younger siblings were my best of friends, and I'm sorry to my family that this is a shock to them, as well as terrible grief, right? So he's not talking to any of those people, her family or uh, her siblings or his family, but now he writes, they loved as much, if not more than me, a new daughter to my mother, an aunt to my nephews. Please do not make this harder for them. This occurred as an unexpected tragedy rushing back to our car trying to cross the streams of illegible before it got too dark to see too cold i hear a splash and a scream i could barely see i couldn't find her for a moment shouted her name i found her breathing heavily gasping she was freezing cold something illegible and the blazing hot national parks in utah yeah, I think he. I think the missing word there may, might be unlike. Unlike. Okay. Um, but I don't know. Um, so the thing that stands out in this paragraph is the unexpected tragedy part. You know, he's he's now going to tell the story of what, according to him, really happened, and um, I think the unexpected tragedy part is really about guilt. You know, I think there's a huge amount of guilt here. Um, it's pretty clear whether this story is true or not. And I'm highly dubious about the accuracy of the story. In fact, I'm, I'm sure it's not accurate. But um, but I think, that, you know, the, the fantasy he's going to create or this version he's going to create for us is he's telling us it's driven by guilt. And he's trying to explain away his guilt by saying that this is an unexpected tragedy. So now he's going to he's going to get into the tragedy a little bit. Sharing that one thing again that I notice in this is right the unexpected tragedy really affects me. Oh, what do you have regret now that you killed her? I mean the unexpected tragedy was something you chose to do whether it was, you know, premeditated or in well, a rage. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's again, he's, he's setting the stage for the rest of the letter, but he's, he's really, I think, trying to appease or, or allay his guilt a little bit. And um, so, you know, to call it an unexpected tragedy is, is a strange way to describe it. Because, I mean, you know, the, just looking at the Moab video, if you look at nothing but the Moab video and you look at the larger picture, there's clearly a history of relationship conflicts. There's yes. clearly prop, right? And so... The unexpected tragedy is, I think, probably more, it's, it's probably more of an expected tragedy in the sense that I think the story's about to tell is a big distortion of what really happened, number one. And it's probably more about whatever the story is to him. My guess is that he probably created some of the, some of the injuries here, right? It would make sense that if he created the energy, let's say that he threw her down, let's say they were arguing and he somehow threw her down and she hurt herself and she couldn't walk back to the van. Um, that's a very different story, right? And, and, and that type of story, by the way, would be one reason why you wouldn't take the body to a hospital. Even if she died from exposure, 
in the elements, which is kind of what he's arguing. I mean, he says he killed her, but he's arguing that she wanted him to kill her. And partly because she was so cold and in such pain. And so, but that doesn't make sense, right? If you look at, if you try to make sense of that story, it doesn't make sense why he wouldn't take the body somewhere. Why he just abandoned the body. Right. In the middle of nowhere, right? Like if you really love someone and you want to help them, I mean, there's 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 so many scenarios we could go through with this, but the bottom line is, you know, he abandoned the body and fled the scene. He went back to Florida. That's not someone who doesn't have a lot of guilt, and that's not someone who would have experienced this kind of natural accident that he's trying to to tell us about. But um, anyway, on that note, well if said. you want to pick up and tell us the story of the accident. Yeah, absolutely. And and you said what many people are saying in comments. And Lee B, another wonderful moderator of ours, said, yeah, I'm reading the description as he snapped and beat her, then came to and tried to comfort her before strangling her. Right, you know? exactly. And that's, 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 that's much more consistent with, I mean, assuming that some version of the story that he's telling is true, I think the parts he's leaving out are probably that they were fighting or maybe she was going to leave him and he pushed her down or somehow injured her in the wilderness, right? Or something like that. I mean, it, it's not that believable anyway, but but I, I certainly could see something like that. And the, so the reason he wouldn't have taken the body to a hospital or somewhere to get help is because whatever injuries he created or however he harmed her, that obviously would have become obvious, if he took her in and he would have been arrested on the spot. So he was avoiding, he was evading capture. He was evading arrest. Right. So. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and Leah Clayton. Oh, and I was going to point out, she said, yeah, he's not taking any responsibility for his actions. This is someone that never seems to have ever taken any responsibility. And I just want to thank Leah for your uh, support. Thank you so much. And Stephanie, thank you too. Everyone loves Dr. John's appearances. Thank you for everyone showing your love tonight. Yes, let's move on and Thanks, say, Stephanie. I'll read to you. Oh, oh go ahead, John. Um, yeah, so now, now you're, the next part, next paragraph is, is getting into the story. He's yes, telling. the temperature had dropped. Is that right? Mm -hmm. The temperature had dropped to freezing and she was soaking wet. I carried her as far as I could from the stream toward the car, stumbling, exhausted in shock, when my something we can't read, and I knew I couldn't carry her safely anymore. I started a fire and spooned her as close to the heat. She was so thin, had already been freezing too long. I couldn't at the time realize that I should have started a fire first, but I wanted her out of the cold and back to the car. From where I started, from where I started the fire, I had no idea how far the car might be. Only knew it was across the creek. Do you want me to keep going? Um, well, you know, I want to folk. Let me just make a comment on that last sentence. Um, that he started a fire and he had no idea how far the car was. He only knew it was across the creek. Well, she's fallen in the creek. So the car can't be that far away, right? Like he's kind of contradicting himself here. He's saying he has no idea how far the car is, but then he knows it's across the creek. So he knows exactly where the car is, right? This is this is this is a big trip. This is a big stumble on his part because he's contradicting himself. And he's kind of saying, you know, I knew where the car was. I just didn't want to take her there, or you know, maybe I couldn't take her there. Um the car is, oops, he knows where it is. He's saying that. So it's a peculiar sentence to write. He's kind of implicating himself with that sentence. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. When I pulled Gabby out of the water, she couldn't tell me what hurt. She had a small bump on her forehead that eventually got larger. Her feet hurt. Her wrist hurt, but she was freezing, shaking violently. While carrying her, she continually made sounds of pain. Laying next to her, she said little. Between violent shakes, gasping in pain, begging for an end to her pain. I want to point out there, she didn't beg to an end for her life. She begged for an end to the pain. Big difference. Mm -hmm. 
She would fall asleep and I would shake her awake, fearing she shouldn't close her eyes if she had a concussion. She would wake up in pain, start her whole painful cycle again, furious that I was the one waking her. Oh, gee, I wonder why. <laughs> she wouldn't let me try to cross the creek, thought, though, like me, thought like me that the fire would go out in her sleep and she would freeze. I don't know the extent of Gabby's injuries, only that she was in extreme pain. I ended her life. I thought it was merciful. That is what she wanted. But I see now all the mistakes I made. I panicked. I was in shock. But from the moment I decided, took away her pain, I knew I could not go on without her. Whew. Unpack that one for us. <laughs> well, the... Um... The, let's start with the first paragraph you read, the bump on her forehead that eventually got larger. Um, I mean, technically, not that there's any need to, because obviously this case is closed, but technically, um, you know, if, if he was uh, captured, if he was caught in some way, um, in theory, that might have been, that might have been found during the autopsy, or that might have been uh, part of the autopsy, the, some type of I don't know if there was a fracture or if it was just a bruise, but um, there might have been some evidence of that to verify whether what he's saying is accurate. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I don't think we've seen the autopsy, but um, but I, I guess if somebody wanted to double check some of the veracity of this, um, that would be one piece of physical evidence you could look at. Um, there's probably no reason to do that, but. Um, so the so he go let's but let's look at the second paragraph. He goes from um, he only knew that she was in extreme pain, so I ended her life. I thought it was merciful. That is what she wanted. But I see now all the mistakes I made. I panicked. I was in shock. I mean. It's not what she wanted either. In no place did he say she wanted her life to end. She wanted the pain to stop, which is what he was inflicting on her, in my opinion, my humble non-psychologist opinion. I, I think this is what makes his story really du dubious, right? Is that most normal people in that scenario would call for help. They would try to find help. They would find other hikers or campers in the area. We know that her body was like in a campground right? They would, there's a lot of options there rather than killing her. So, I mean, it, it, it's killing her probably would be the absolute last resort. And even then you wouldn't kill someone. And you, you know, you, I, even then I think you would fight to the end to try to save her, right? To take her to a hospital. Exactly. Um, As Sue was saying, she's not an animal. Take her to the hospital. Right. It's <laughs> exactly. And also, whose decision is that, right? I mean, he's saying he, again, he's 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 blaming this on her. He's saying she was in such pain, she was begging me uh, to kill her, right? I mean, it's yeah, it's disgusting, right, Julie? Right? He's blaming her murder on her. Yeah, I know. It's 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 someone who's has a very distorted view of the world let's say that and what he's calling love and i i said this on my interview by the way um with fox that what he's what he's calling love and one of one of the anchors said well they were truly in love i'm i'm calling it something else right it's it's more like dependency or symbiosis or it's not this is not a healthy relationship obviously um and so uh, I think this really kind of undermines the accuracy or the validity of his whole story is when he goes from her being in pain to, you know, I had to end her life. I guess maybe he's kind of acknowledging some responsibility when he says that he saw his mistakes, but not really. Right. People are pointing out. Thank you, Julie, so much for your support. People are po pointing out that the reporter that was where her body was discovered had great self-service but not just that the the youtubers with the camera that sort of realized that they saw the van and brian shut, shutting the door of that van um if it was really something again he could have gotten their help not shut the door on them so they wouldn't see right so there, there were there were people camping there they were in a fairly public camp area 
where her body was found. I didn't know about the cell service, but that that makes it even more compelling. He could have called. He could have called at any time for help. I mean, maybe he would argue that his cell phone died. I don't know, but but obviously, he could have he could have found help in other ways. So this is just not believable. This is a guilty conscience expressing itself and really distorting the facts. I think. And you're right. I can't get over the fact that he is. He's writing it for the public. Trace on the case. Well said. He's even romanticizing it with the whole spooning thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, this right. Is a wonderful moment. Right. He's hurt her. <laughs> she's in pain, but he's remembering that it was romantic, you know, and he spooned her. I, it's so. Right. He's that. Yeah, that's a really good observation, right? He's protecting her and loving her until the point where he murders her. <laughs> right. Like, let's let's not forget that little piece. So yeah, good job spooning there, Brian. You really saved the day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's not funny, but it's just so awful. It's just. Yeah. Huh. Um, I rushed home to spend any time I had left with my family. So it sounds like there maybe he was already suicidal. He knew what he was going to do. He rushed home to spend any time I had left with my family. I wanted to drive north and let James or TJ kill me, but I wouldn't want them to spend time in jail over my mistake, even though I'm sure they would have liked to. I am ending my life not because of fear of punishment but rather because I can't stand to live another day without her. I've lost our whole future together, every moment we could have shared. I'm sorry for everyone's loss. Please do not make life harder for my family. They lost a son and a daughter, the most wonderful girl in the world. Gabby, I'm sorry. I have killed myself by the, this creek in the hopes that animals may tear me apart, that it may make some of her family happy again. Please pick up all of my things. Gabby hated people who litter. Yeah. So, so these these are the most. This is the most loaded part of the ooh. of the letter. Um, you know, let's start with the. I rushed home to spend any time left with my family. I mean, that implies that he's not in control of his life. That implies, yes, it does appear that he made a decision to kill himself, but he has as much time left as he wants. There's no need to rush. And again, why leave the body behind? If this was an accident, why rush home and leave the body in some, you know, part of the wilderness where it's going to get torn apart, right? Like, he's, you know, he's, this is a rationalization. He's guilt. He has a lot of guilt, and he's rationalizing his behavior in a way that that is very apparent. I mean, um, the he says, "I'm ending my life not because of fear of punishment, but rather because I can't stand to live another day without her." But huh. obviously, there is a fear of punishment, or I guess, oh, let me put it social punishment. What's that? Social punishment there is, the way he tries to clear up his public perception of him. Right. There, there's a fear of being judged publicly. There's impression management. Um, but I think the more interesting thing is that he, in some ways, um, there's the bigger form of punishment is self-punishment. And he doesn't seem to have a lot of fear of that. He's going to kill himself. So, um there is a lot of self-punishment going on, obviously, that, you know, the willingness to take his life over all the guilt he's experiencing. Um, when he says, Gabby, I'm sorry, you know, that's that's the closest he comes to a confession. That's the closest he comes to actually expressing something emotionally. But, you know, it, again, like we learn about we learn a lot about Brian Laundry here by what he's not saying. You know, he's not saying, Gabby, I'm sorry. I feel such grief over your over this loss. I feel such sadness. I, right. He's not, <clears throat> there's no emotion he's bringing into play. I'm sorry is quite different than there's so much more he should have said there. In this moment, this is the most revealing moment. In this moment of confession and apology, he's not saying what he really should be saying. <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess you could argue that this is someone who's probably not really good with his emotions, and that makes sense. Um, you know, in domestic violence in general, which we might talk about in a little bit, but um, 
probably the, the most researchers agree that the biggest element of domestic violence is control, coercive control is the common term now. And coercive control is largely a defense mechanism against feeling emotions such as sadness, vulnerability, helplessness. I think those are the things that Brian Laundrie couldn't really deal with. And I think Gabby Petito was very independent. Um, I think that he wanted to control her in the sense that he didn't want her to hurt him. Clearly. And he didn't want her to reject him. And so that was quite obvious from the Moab um, video that we analyzed. But here in this moment of I'm sorry, of apology and confession, he really doesn't have anything profound to say, which I, I think is, is really sad. It is sad. I noted when he was also saying, I can't live without her. And that is why I'm killing myself. That's often something that abusers use in relationships too. If, if you're not with me, if I can't control this relationship, I'm going to kill myself. I'm suicidal now if you don't stay with me. And so right. if, if there was a moment where she was saying, I think I'm going to leave you, you know, after all their hardships and this van trip, um, that could have even be what led to his rage. And he thought, well, if I'm not going to have her, then no one is, you know, that right. might be a closer motive. Yeah, I, know I think that's, Go ahead. Um, I think there's a version of that here for sure. Um, you know, this next line, I have killed myself by this creek, creek in the hopes that animals might tear me apart. Again, that's, um, that's pretty severe, right? That's, that's a real form of like self-hatred and self-punishment. Um, and uh, I mean, he's saying essentially that he feels such guilt that um, he wants to be essentially destroyed by animals. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a real punitive element to his, to what he's, to his tone in this, in this letter that he's at least here, right. That he's, He's hoping that animals tear him apart. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a typical thing to put in a suicide letter. He's, he's already going to kill himself, but he can't, you know, when you kill yourself, you can't really control what happens after that. So he's taking this extra step of saying, you know, I hope they tear me apart, which um, I think in, in some ways too, he's kind of, he's trying to um, represent how he feels internally. He feels a lot of turmoil and he feels a lot of distress. And so I think that he's he's kind of hoping that, he's kind of saying that this is gonna happen to me. I hope this happens to me um, because that's how I feel inside. Mm -hmm. Right, well said. Um, and then when he says, um, and that it may make some of her family happy, I mean, um, you know, that's, that's a really, <laughs> Again, it gets into that kind of punitive mindset um, that he sees her family as being very adversarial, and rightly so. They were quite upset. They wanted to know where their daughter was, and he knew but didn't disclose. Right. Um, he indicates, Carrie Livingston wrote, he indicates he cared for Gabby's family. Well, look at how much he cared. He ignored them after murdering Gabby, and they had to look for their daughter. Right. And he's saying here that, um, you know, if, if animals tear him apart, that'll make them happy. So clearly he's got some, he's got some mixed feelings about uh, how he feels about the family. And he, it, and again, I think this is indicative of a guilty conscience. Um, he knows what he did was, he, he know he killed her. He knows this story is, is not accurate. He knows he's distorting it. Um, and I think he's being quite honest here and saying, look, you know, I feel horribly about this, which by the way, his guilt is, you know, it's compared to a lot of the psychopaths I deal with, like to see guilt is, you know, a positive. He wasn't, he, was, he wasn't like a total monster. He did have apparently a little bit of a conscience. So um, he just didn't know how to kind of direct his moral compass. Um, so, but this is, this is a really interesting line to kind of end with. Um, um, in terms of showing what's in his mind and showing how much he hates himself and how he wants what, to be punished. What is that last line again? Oh, no, I'm still on the animals. The last line okay. is, please pick up all of my things. So this line is really fascinating too. The last line is, please pick up all of my things. Gabby hated people who litter. Um, so my, my thought about that was, 
<laughs> you know, that there's a real irony in, the, in this line because he brought a backpack and he was littering, right? She hated people who littered and he was littering, literally littering yeah. in that spot. And so what does that mean? Did she hate him? Is he telling us that she hated him because he litters? And remember the fight in Moab? It was about him, his stinky feet in the van and how she asked him repeatedly to, to wash his feet and he didn't. And, right. you know, and so the fight began over something very simple. And I, I think this is kind of a version of that, that um, when she told him to be respectful of the van and to not enter the van with bare feet, he said, I'm going to enter the van with bare feet. I don't care what you think. Right. And so in some ways, this is a really fascinating ending because He's saying, I hope people pick up after this mess I'm making because she hated people who litter. So I'm going to do I'm it. littering. I don't care what you think. I'm littering. Maybe you did hate me. Right. And again, right. like to end yeah. a suicide note with this kind of ambiguity and this kind of, you know, it's a really, really peculiar way to end a suicide note. Usually people will end with, you know, the I love you or I'm sorry or more of an explanation of why they're doing it. But here he's like, she hated people who littered and I'm littering. So, right. <laughs> so uh, that's how I really feel. And to the very end, she's not going to control me. Right. Right. Exactly. Like you may hate people who litter, but guess what? I'm exactly. I'm expressing myself by littering. So take that. Yeah. And so I like what see, Finca just wrote. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. And so, and so I think in this last line, you actually see some of the anger and some of the rage that he had that that made him, you know, that, that led to the murder, that showed that he was capable of murder. You know, this is not, he's trying to present himself here as um, a someone who's saving her. He's, he's presenting himself as a rescuer, as a as a good guy, right? And yet, that's really not where he's leaving us with these last two lines about the animals and the family, upsetting the family and the littering. He's, he's really given us a very different picture of himself there. Right. And, and essentially saying, Gabby made me do it. Gabby made me litter. Uh, I like this Finca comment. Thank you for writing this. He's just building the cinema, cinematic romanticized version of what happened so he can control the narrative. He completed their story. Seems all controlling to me, abusive to the core. It's true. He completed their story until the very end. She hated littering, so here I go. Right, exactly. And he's he's trying to control the narrative here. Um, he tried to control it with her when he was with her. Um, yeah, um, this is a you know I think this is a really interesting look into Brian Laundry's psyche. Yeah. I agree. I agree. People are asking some interesting questions or is there anything else you want to say? Hey, scientific skeptic. Good to see you here. Oh, scientific skeptic, by the way, is a good friend of ours. Uh, he does something that very few channels do, uh, delves into true crime channels and discusses how, um, unethical they are. So we're always excited when he shows up and always a bit nervous too. We're like, oh, he's here. <laughs> But good to have you on. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> yes. Um, there are some interesting questions here. Okay. Someone asked if you've seen cases like this before. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I've dealt with a lot of domestic violence cases over the years. Uh, I'd say domestic violence and sex offense cases are probably the most common cases I deal with. So, uh, yes, I, I haven't seen a case with quite like this in the sense that it, you know, it received so much public attention. Um, uh, and, you know, with, with these kinds of dynamics, but I think the underlying issues that crop up in domestic violence were here, um, which would be, in my opinion, um, you know, control is widely regarded, controlling a relationship is widely regarded as probably um, the primary element in domestic violence. And um, generally speaking, there's going to be two, two areas that a, a, an abuser would try to control. One is, is how they're seen, how they're perceived, right? So that's the impression management component. That abusers want to be seen as 
powerful and lovable and you know um, um, <laughs> strong. Uh, and so when there's evidence that deviates from that, they try to kind of move the narrative back to that. So I think there's there's always kind of this attempt to manage people's impressions. Um, and the second area of control I kind of mentioned earlier, which is that most abusers really struggle with any sense of uh, vulnerability or shame or sadness or really kind of difficult emotions. And um, there's a lot of defense mechanisms against that. Um, and the reason I think they do that is because um, they don't want to expose those emotions because they're afraid of being hurt. Um, and so control allows them to kind of bury those emotions and to make sure that their partners don't in some ways incite or provoke any of the emotions that they find to be really uncomfortable. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot. A lot of interesting comments here. Patrice is saying that the laundry family chose to make this public. Why would they do that? Can they actually believe this? The letter? Yeah. So the laundry family, Brian's family. Right. It was the, it was the attorney for the family. Um, I, again, I think impression management, I think the family, maybe the family hopes that the, the story that Brian laundry is telling or the narrative he's conveying here will be seen as true. I think the family really believes that a good chunk of people that see the letter will think, Oh, wait, this wasn't domestic violence. This is really an accident, right? I mean, there's so many holes in that story, of course, that that it doesn't make sense, right? That, that there would be no logical reason why he wouldn't call for help if it was an accident. There'd be no logical reason why the body wouldn't be taken to, even if she was deceased, it wouldn't be taken to a hospital or, or he wouldn't at some point drive all night to get to the nearest hospital to try to help her or save her, right? Like none of that adds up here. So, but but I think... In, you know, in today's world where um, I don't mean to offend anyone, but, you know, where QAnon is is a regular part of a, millions of people's lives, um, I don't know. It's hard to know what people will believe and what they'll, they'll see as accurate. And so I think they're putting this out there to try to see if this narrative catch on, catches on and, and it would, you know, resuscitate his his image to some degree would be, it would you'd go from being one of the most detested villains in American history to um, a good guy, to someone who tried to help someone in need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is it the most, when you cover cases, what am I trying to ask with domestic violence um, abusers? You shared in a past video we did on this case some telltale signs that you saw in Brian. You showed some research, some statistics that show even if he doesn't have a history of murder or violent tendencies, sometimes these are the men that end up murdering. What are some of those things that you saw in Brian as an abuser or do you remember? Probably the biggest risk factor the research supports that the biggest risk, risk factor for uh, abuse is possessiveness um, and closely aligned with possessive, possessiveness would be jealousy. So those two are kind of interrelated, but, um, and the more jealousy and the more possessiveness, the worse it is for the relationship and the higher the risk. So somebody who's extraordinarily possessive is going to be at a greater risk for not only inciting violence, but for eventually um, killing someone, murdering someone in a, in a, in a close relationship. So um, I think that's, those are probably the biggest ones, but um, the other one, the second one that crops up or the third one is fear of abandonment. Um, it's well known that when a relationship ends and when there's some type of rejection, the risks for fatalities for domestic fatalities go up tremendously. So the highest risk portion of any relationship is when it ends. 
and particularly when there's a you know an abusive relationship and violence in the relationship it's very very difficult to get out and that's why many women struggle there's a lot of reasons they struggle with getting out um but but certainly um fear for their life is one of them yeah colette uh robin b and uh liz johnson two two wonderful listeners that we appreciate so much thank you for your support and colette too thank you colette's Colette is one of our moderators and she, she uh, is asking you, dear Dr. John, why does my brain tell me that that line about her family wanting him to be torn apart was written by Brian's mother? Am I totally off base? I'm often on base. I don't off base. I don't get offended. <laughs> yeah, um, that would be, you know, Colette, that would be a really interesting dynamic. Um, I sort of read that as, as, uh that it was that it was written to her family but um if it was written to his mother that would certainly you know that we'd be getting into some really deep freudian stuff with that um <laughs> well and uh, then her next comment is do i just accuse every abuser of having mommy issues and i like this question because yeah that's what i sometimes go to you know i've been reading a lot John knows about misogyny recently, just trying to understand it. We even recorded a quick little uh, Patreon episode. We'll be posting, I think, well, late, uh, hopefully this weekend and uh, about misogyny. And it seems like it all goes down to mommy issues. Yeah, Freudian, talk to us about that. Uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> my, my, my answer has to be it depends. I want to say yes, but... Um, there's a there's an old school psychiatrist, forensic psychiatrist, um, and uh, his name is uh, Daniel Abramson. And um, back in the '60s and '70s, he was probably like the preeminent forensic guy. And um, he argued that almost every murderer he encountered had some type of mommy issues. So uh, I'm I'm going to pin it on him. Um, and I'm not going to take a stand. I'm going to pin it on him because it's, you know, the evidence for that, the empirical evidence is, is probably a little questionable, but, um, you know, anecdotally, I think uh, a lot of them do have mommy issues or, you know, as Liz just said, daddy issues. Um, the, the parental issues, by the way, can be tied back to, you know, we talk a lot about attachment, um, which makes more sense to me in terms of contemporary theory. Um, Attachment is quite simply that a child who um, does not have a secure relationship with his parents uh, is going to have later problems down the road because they're going to feel insecure, they're going to feel vulnerable, they're going to feel more helpless. So um, that sense of safety, creating a sense of safety with a child is so critical in future development and adult development. And it's something we seek, every one of us, no matter how old we are, we all seek some degree of safety and security throughout our lives. So you can imagine that um, in those early years when we're not getting the love we need and we're not attaching properly to our parents, both of them, either one or the other, um, that's going to create a lot of problems down the road. Right. The things that I've read to, oh, and Moonlight View, thank you. She, she Thank you for the support. She just read in and out date money for you too. Thank you. Everyone <laughs> knows we love in and out. That's about as fancy as John and I go for dates. Yeah. By the way, that wasn't the way it was when we were dating. So as wonderful as our marriage is and John is, some things never change. He whined and well, dined we, me during the dating phase, and now we're in and out or bust. <laughs> should we tell people a, a little secret that we, I don't know. every year we, because it's one of the few places that's open on Christmas Eve, we have our, <laughs> we have a tradition of going to in and out every Christmas Eve for our little um, Christmas Eve feast. Yes. So thank you for thank you for that. <laughs> we'll we, we'll enjoy in and out. Right, right, and uh, yeah, we won't wait for our special meal at, at Christmas Eve either. We'll go before. Right, that's true. John, I've been very clear that John married a woman that did not cook, and I married a man who did cook until we had a child. So uh, in and out <laughs> for Christmas Eve. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, people are asking, uh, where was it? Thank you everyone for your support tonight. Everyone's been so kind. Um, I agree, every abuser has mommy issues. 
And uh, I, I would love to do a whole Patreon episode with you on that, John. By the way, I have questions. I have questions. Thank you, Lisa, again for your other donation. Um, where is it? I want to post it. Somebody is asking if the audio podcast is over. And I thought maybe you could, I'm putting you on the spot, but you could talk a little bit about that and where they might. Yeah. Um, yeah. Quit. The answer is no, it's not over. Um, uh, we are still planning on audio podcasts. We're actually working on a few at the moment, but um, we were derailed a little bit with Daybell because there were all these document dumps and new information was coming out and it's an active case. And um, I started having concerns that because the case was becoming so large and it was um, the trial kept getting put off indefinitely um, that I was concerned about having any kind of influence on the case. So, um, so we're not done with Daybell, but we're having a lot of debates about how and when we're going to come back with future episodes and the potential impact of those episodes and the ethics of putting out stuff. And um, we will have future episodes. Um, I think looking back, I think choosing an active case made it way more difficult to <laughs> um to post regularly because um you know if we were if we were discussing ted bundy you know clearly there'd be no ethical issues or issues around doing an analysis of a case that's well over but um but we keep doing that though now we're now we're into rebecca barsotti another well it's not a case how about that rebecca barsotti just simply isn't a case it's it's a situation that I believe deserves a case or an investigation, but yeah, it's not yeah. a case yet. We're working to make it a case. Yeah. Um, Ivana Ivy, thank you so much. Uh, she said, speaking of emotional abuse that she got my book escaping emotional abuse and, uh, hoping there will be an audible version for us whose eyeballs don't want to work. I hope so too. I guess I could read it, but that also sounds overwhelming because it's a, um, it's a memoir. And, you know, we all change and we all grow and we all move on. And, and um, it, it's something that would be hard for me to, like, even, I think, revisit and read now. If that makes sense. So maybe we can hire someone to do that. Uh, Kay Woodcock, uh, speaking of the Daybell case, we have Kay Valla Woodcock and Larry Woodcock with us today. And uh, one thing I want you um, all to know, too, is because of John's concerns, we did continue our podcast in a way and are continuing it on our Patreon account. And we know that not everyone can do that, which is why we do do free YouTube videos. But if anyone is interested, that's where a lot of Dr. John's analysis are. And we're going to do Zulema still, right? We're still going to do Zulema. Zulema is on the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll do Zulema. Right. So the other answer to that question is that we, I did, I switched over or we switched over to Patreon for, we're still active and posting stuff on Patreon regularly. And the reason for that is because um, it alleviates some of the privacy issues that we would run into if we were still talking about Day Bell more publicly. So <clears throat> um, I know it's not ideal for some people, um, but you know, privacy and um, influence and ethical issues are always kind of at the forefront of my mind and decisions and Patreon. Um, because it's a private group allows us to talk about things more openly and more freely. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you, Kate Marlowe. Kate is saying that she has the same top that I do. I love that because we love Kate. So that's, that's so flattering. I'm so glad peppered with leopard. Thank you. Kay Woodcock is saying we love Dr. John's analysis of the two evils. It was eye opening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we were grateful to become friends with the Woodcocks through this. They lost their grants in JJ and recently posted an interview with them on our channel. Um, thank you, Wyoming Adventure. More questions. Um, Thanks, that, Kay. Thank you, Kay. Um, thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. With, with the Brian Laundry case in, in analyzing the body cam footage, what was the most telling thing that stood out to you? Because one thing that you did do early on in the case was everybody was stating, including the Moab police, that Gabby was the abuser. 
Then the body cam footage came out while she was missing. Right. And that's what people were saying. And, and there were some experts going on live television stating similarly, Oh, we don't see anything wrong with Brian laundry, you know, and you watched it and it was so clear to you what was going on. Um, I know it's been a while, but do you recall what the most telling thing was? I know for me what the thing was for me that you said, but I'm curious. Um, I think the way he was managing the police was really interesting. I think he was being passive aggressive and very controlling with the police. And he was trying to, again, he was trying to do a lot of impression management. Um, but I think the, I think the real telltale sign was the fact that she was afraid. I think that her fear and his lack of fear um, was probably one of the most important elements that people saw that she was very emotional and she was very upset. And I, I think that the way I read that was that she was afraid. And I think it was clear to me that her violence is what we call reactive violence, which means that she was respond. He had already hit her and slapped her earlier. He'd locked her out of the van earlier in the day. And when they were driving into the park and were pulled over at that point, he had already like grabbed her in the van. Um, at that point, she was just trying to, she was reacting and responding to his violence um, and trying to escape in some ways. And I think she was afraid. You know, one of the, there's some interesting research by uh, John Gottman, who's done a lot with relationships, but he, it's not well known that he did uh, a, a study with um, Neil Jacobson back in the late 90s, um, looking at domestic violence. And that's one of the things they found is that the male, the males who, it was only the males who were violent, but the males who were violent had no fear. So even when their partners reacted or tried to fight back, um, they were unafraid. In fact, they kind of mocked them. They mocked the victims. And mm -hmm. Um, but the victims were all afraid that they had a lot of fear about what was going to happen. And they had a lot of fear about being physically abused. So, um, so I, I think that was, that was a pretty good clue that there were, there were some issues there because, um, you know, she, she seemed to be afraid and that would be based on a history of violence in the relationship. Yeah. Thank you. One thing I noticed too, and you noticed too, is he minimized her ambitions. But the one thing you said on Fox was the first thing you said on Fox when they asked you, they said, well, I'm confused. There was so much love in the videos on van life that, you know, you saw. And your first response was, I didn't see that love. And it was such a moment. No one even knew what to say. And they looked at you and you said, look, did he ever say, I love her. I'm worried about her. I'm concerned right. about her. Is she right. okay? You know, not once. He was not he was once. only right. He was only concerned about how it would impact him. In fact, from the very moment the police pulled them over uh, and they separated them, which is common practice in domestic violence, the first thing he said was, What did she say to you? Right? He wanted to know, he wanted to know if she disclosed the the history of abuse in the relationship. So you, instead of saying, Is she okay? How she's how is she doing? Is she safe? I'm worried about her, he said. What did she say to you, right? So um, that's a really peculiar thing to say. That's not how you're typically going to start off a conversation with the police when they pull you over. Um, so that there were a lot of clues. But um, I think, uh, you know, that his controlling, kind of controlling nature, the fear that she was showing, um, there were so many things going on there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people are asking if rules change for Utah, YouTube two and a half years ago. I don't know what that means, but Joe, John and I are remaining the same on YouTube. Um, so uh, for those that didn't know, we started with an audio podcast and then I went to YouTube and we still do YouTube, but we've lessened Dr. John's appearances and he does uh, Patreon episodes. I'll let my, our mods finish answering all those questions. I've been a little confused. Maybe I'm missing part of the conversation. Um, but I understand some confusion is there. John, thank you. Is there anything else you want to say? Well, actually, I want to say something. So we're covering 
a non-case right now about Rebecca Barsati. We also have a Rebecca Barsati playlist. We have a Gabby Petito playlist for those that want to catch up. It's listed in here. And for those that are new to our channel, a Rebecca Barsati playlist. And so I'm covering this non-case. It should be a case where a woman who the male, the man, the, the estranged husband she had moved out had a domestic violent um, charge against her and a no contact order. She went missing, similar to Gabby Petito, went missing, and then her body was found a um, month later, 10 months later, recently. And there's no investigation, in it seems, as far as I can tell, into um, there's certainly no you know murder investigation or concerns, and there's no person of interest in the case. But um, it just feels like this happens a lot, and... It feels like people in general need to learn and understand domestic violence a lot more than they do and that I do and that everyone does. And I'm curious, any tips you might have or what you would hope people may or may not do to, to learn and understand domestic violence more? Um, I mean, it, it, it's such a complex topic um true any books you recommend any? you know the the gottman jacobson book uh, you know the, the study i just mentioned um the gottman jacobson book i think is it's called when men batter women um it's now quite dated but um i think they're it's a very straightforward readable book um and i think it provides a really excellent introduction to domestic violence relationships they have a chapter on myths surrounding domestic violence um, that they really, uh, it, it, let me, it's still relevant. Let me just say that. It's still, even though the research is a little dated, um, it's still an excellent introduction to domestic violence and domestic abuse. And um, um, it's worth reading. If, if someone has questions about domestic violence or wants to understand some of the myths that get perpetuated, um, I think they do an excellent job of really clarifying some of those issues. Thank you. Thank you. And you're going to have to be careful with this question too, but... Um, <laughs> is, but it uh, a, is it an Amber Heard, Johnny Depp question? No, that's been mentioned. We're, we're not those. taking those. We're not taking those. No, none of those. Uh, but... Uh, Someone was asking your thoughts about the Rebecca Barsati case. Any thoughts you can share with us right now? I think it's a fascinating case. I think that the underlying foundation for the case is domestic violence. And I think that's been overlooked. And if you put that into play, I think everything changes. So I, I don't know why that's not relevant. I mean, we all know that when a spouse goes missing or turns up dead, that typically the other spouse has some involvement. I, the numbers are astronomical. Like I think it's like over 90% that the other spouse usually has some involvement. Um, but when you throw in domestic violence and some history of domestic violence, you know, it's, the numbers are even higher. So why there has been no investigation or why there's been no concerns about the husband, and I say husband because they were in the process of getting divorced but had not divorced, um, I don't know. You know, I think those are questions that need exploring. And um, it's, it's an interesting case because it has so many angles and um, I think if we did nothing other than to get law enforcement to start looking a little deeper and a little harder at what's going on, I think that would be a big accomplishment. And maybe that's our goal right now. Right. Well said. We do have um, we do have recordings of a hitman wanting to kill her parents, or David Barsotti, the husband wanting to kill the, uh, Rebecca Barsotti's parents. Those are on our YouTube channel. Some are on True Crime Underground's YouTube channel. And Handle With Care, we did not edit any of the profanity in them. So if you're sensitive to that, FYI. And um, 
Somebody said Suzanne Morphe Morphew. Yes, exactly. There's, there's, exactly. There's so many of these these types of relationships that that occur. Um, it's it's like that, um, except and and on that issue of the recordings, by the way, I mean, an obvious question is, why would someone want to kill the parents of the missing victim of the dis now deceased victim right what i mean what's their motive probably that they killed her <laughs> but right what's their motive and why is that not being investigated either is that not a crime it's a crime it's a felony to, to and know, nobody's to investigating that i will um, say this too there was a county commissioner meeting where uh it's an interesting meeting i will post it i will post it after this where angela barsetti spoke and laid out some concerns she had about the investigation or lack of investigation into her daughter's disappearance. It was in November. She makes some really valuable claims. The sheriff's response and rebuttal was very upsetting to me. And he states, and one thing is just because David Barsati was charged with a crime, you know, a couple months before she went missing does not mean da da da. da. And I said, call it what it is. It's not a crime. It's a domestic crime violence crime and would you not agree john that's a big difference there a shoplifting crime is a lot different than a threatening to beat your wife crime <laughs> so right. I mean, I mean, that in itself shows how they're minimizing their domestic violence in this case and it's upsetting to me right because I, I guess technically a parking ticket is a, is a crime so i mean yeah there's a big difference between um you know um a parking violation or even like a, a moving, you know, a speeding violation versus abusing your spouse with, and there's, we have pictures with bruises. Like clearly there were injuries to the spouse. It wasn't, this wasn't him shoving someone. This was him physically harming her and bruising her face. We have Nathan, the man that I referred to as the hitman with us here tonight. And he is right. He is not a hitman. And so I'm glad he corrected me. I was using that casually. This is him. I know that this is him. And, and we talked earlier today and I know he tunes in. So hi, Nathan. Um, he is not a hitman. What Nathan did is actually very brave. And I'll explain that since he's here. I, I, I skipped over that too, too quickly. I want to explain this, that, Nathan was approached by an investigator earlier, early on in the case, John Baker, I believe is in his name. And Nathan was saying, I believe that he, my friend is David Barsotti, and I believe that he killed Rebecca. And I'm talking to him every day. And this private investigator said, why don't you start recording your calls with him? Nathan handed over about, you know, five hours of calls to me, recorded calls. We've gone through all of them on the, on the recording. The reason why I called Nathan a hitman and refer to him as the hitman is as far as David Barsotti was aware, he was hiring a hitman. So Nathan was not a hitman. He was recording knowing that a private investigator named John Baker knew he was recording. So, and, and he has stated on our channel in a couple of different interviews that uh, he never had any intentions to going through with it. Although it sounds like it on the recordings. So, I appreciate him saying that when I refer to a hitman, I refer to from what it sounds like on the recordings to me that David Barsotti thinks he's hiring a hitman in exchange for a dog. You know, um, he, he trained dogs and he would often get people to do things he wanted by giving them dogs. So anyway, thank you, Nathan, for being here. And thank you for allowing me to clarify that. And Steph, and if anyone's confused right now, since we've gone from Gabby Petito to Rebecca Barsotti and not everyone here might pay attention to this case. Thank you, Stephanie Budge. To get familiar with the case, please follow this link here. And uh, since I brought it up, I will be posting that commissioner's meeting as well. It has a lot of information. Thank you, Nathan. And he says his leg is doing well. Thank you. Um, what else, John? Anything else you want to say? Oh, the, the, there was a question I took off when I saw Nathan was here. And somebody asked if you'd ever be willing to do uh, analysis of perhaps some basics of David Barsotti. And I think that you might be when it comes to our Patreon account, right? 
we're working on that. John is not going to assess, you know, without more knowledge, but. Yeah. In order for me to assess uh, David Barsati in any depth, I'd need to really talk to a lot of people and do some in-depth interviews. And um, we're, we're in the process of, of working on that. So um, yeah, I'm not sure where, where, where we can talk about that. Um, you know, openly, I'm not sure we can, we'll, we'll see where we can post that, but I think, um, we're moving in that direction and, um, I just need to really dig a little deeper and learn more about David Barsati and his, his family and his upbringing. And, um, we're working on that. So hopefully we will get there. Okay. Colette Cox, she, uh, she would like to know your feelings in general about a dying confession. Um, she gives no specifics there, but any thoughts about someone leaving a confession as they're dying or lack of someone doing that? Some people hold it to the grave and others. Uh, you know, I, my, I think it depends on the mental health of the person in question. So I think somebody who's dying that's been pretty open and has a fair amount of mental health, um, is probably going to give a pretty valid, accurate confession and, you know, picture of their life or whatever it is they're trying to convey. Whereas someone who's more paranoid and someone with more severe mental health problems is probably going to be more dubious and more questionable in terms of what they're confessing to. So, um, so my answer to that is, you know, the confession will be largely dependent upon the person and their mental level of mental health and their ability to be open and transparent about their lives. And that's how I would, you know, evaluate the validity of a confession. And so I think with, with Brian Laundrie, we see someone whose mental health probably isn't the greatest and you see some real distortions in the way he's conveying this. I, I keep thinking one last question will go. And I know this is like a heavy multifaceted question. This question is like its <laughs> own show when it comes to Dr. John, its own <laughs> hour show, because John works with, abusers and helps them so quick answer uh do i think an abuser can change yes i do i absolutely do i've i've led groups for uh domestic violence perpetrators i used to lead groups for domestic violence perpetrators for many years uh, i've worked with uh registered sex offenders and convicted sex, sex offenders for many years um, and I've seen many of them make significant changes. Um, so yes, I, I do believe they can. I think the process can be lengthy at times because some of them do have some severe mental health problems and that takes time. Um, but I found that groups can be really helpful and curative and, uh, groups are, I think are very, very powerful f for felons because they feel like they're among um, peers that understand them and have, have committed similar types of crimes. So yes, they can change. Thank you. And one of those is to help them find empathy. Isn't that right? As you say. Yeah, I, I think that one of the commonalities among many of the people I work with is they um, are very self-absorbed. They probably have many narcissistic qualities um, that's not to say they're diagnosed as narcissists, but they have a lot of those qualities. And a big part of the groups is to try to get them to understand their impact on their victims and to develop some empathy and compassion for other people. Mm -hmm. Paula Marie is asking, what about an abuser who actually has a psych degree and, and educated an abuser, in other words? And, and, and before you answer, I want to sh share something because we have a lot of women listening. Whether or not abusers can change isn't, I don't think a question that uh, the abused or the all, you know, women who are being abused here right now should take into consideration as to whether or not to stay as in, if you're being abused, um, I hope you can get out. In other words, is what I'm saying. You know, it's and, not up and, for us. And also the, you know, if, if the hope is that the, if you're in an abusive relationship and the hope is that you can change the, the abuser that's probably unlikely it usually right. requires um people that are not enmeshed in that dysfunctional relationship to really impact to have any major impact on the abuser yeah. so um 
they can change, but it, it takes a long time and it probably is best, you know, facilitated by someone who's not emotionally involved in the relationship. Right. By you saying you work with abusers to help them change by no means means you can change your abuser at all. At all. Right. And and again, going back to the risk factors, the more jealousy and the more possessiveness. So if somebody is isolating you I, economically, um, physically, you know, if, if somebody is really trying to and socially isolate you, um, that's pretty severe. You know, the, the more the isolation and the more the possessiveness and the more the, the jealousy, the harder it's going to be to change someone. Yeah. I think we hit a, I think we hit something there. There are a lot of comments scrolling saying, thank you. Right. We can't change them. So many stay because they think we can change them. And so perhaps, right. Just again, to reiterate, yeah. don't, if you know, this is not up to us. This is not about us making them change. And that's, that's not going to happen necessarily if you're in an abusive relationship, it might happen if they ever choose to get help after having lost themselves, but it's not up to us. And, and anything, I else wanna, that, anything else you want to say to that, to those that are abused, thinking that they can change someone, because I've also seen you, you know, help those that are abused, get out of a situation too. I think as a general rule, when you're in a relationship, when you're in a healthy relationship, you know, the general rule is if you have to change someone, it's probably not the healthiest relationship. So, um, you know, hopefully there's a certain level of acceptance we have in our relationships. Um, but when there's violence, it changes the dynamic drastically. You know, it changes the power dynamics. It changes everything. It changes the level of trust. You know, when someone abuses you physically, there's a huge sense. There's a huge loss of trust. There's a sense of betrayal. I think it's it's so hard to rebuild that trust. But um, if the expectation is to, that you're going to change an abuser, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be super hopeful about that. I think it would be interesting to look at the dynamics of the family that you grew up in, if that's the case, in terms of you know, was was your father, you know, an alcoholic? Was he abusive towards your mother? Um, did did you know your mom or or the children think that they could change him? Right, like. I don't know. There's so many issues that go on when we when we consider that stuff. But um, but generally speaking, I think if a relationship gets to the point where you're hoping that someone will change, it's it's probably not a good sign. Nathan is asking, Doctor John, when a man actually breaks that barrier of laying his hands on a woman, how does he prevent himself from continuously doing it? And I think that's actually something that might even have to do with Brian Laundry or, or others, yeah. you know, that the abuse started and it, it's a barrier that breaks, I think, just for some men. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I think the, the first time, I mean, okay. So, um, I know when we were talking to the abuse and now we're talking to abusers. So it is, <laughs> we are, do have a multifaceted thing going. So, I mean, I don't know if this is the right, someone saying, Kate saying great question, Nathan. And so, let me just, while you think about that, I just want to make it clear to people. We answered a question, can abusers change? Yes. John works with both abusers and the abused and how he treats them is very different. So us going back and forth right now, please understand that, that um, I just want to clarify that. Please understand that w when he's talking, you know, about how to help, let's say in general terms, an abuser, he's not referring to what the abuse should be doing to fix things. This is not up to you. Um, so to answer Nathan's question, I mean, the problem with breaking that barrier is that you lose trust in the relationship. And, you know, the simple answer is to the fullest extent possible, you have to stop any type of abuse or violence from occurring again to rebuild trust. So if you can rebuild trust, you might have a chance to repair the relationship, but you're not going to rebuild trust by continuing to abuse someone. Um, how do you prevent it? The short answer is you have to you have to try to I mean okay so the most immediate way that people prevent violence from occurring in the future is to very simple it's a very simple behavioral step which is to take a time out. So in other words 
you have to recognize that you're angry or you're in a rage or whatever. And then you have to try to, once you recognize it, you have to step back from it. You have to buy some time. You have to create some space. So how do you stop it? The best way to stop it, of course, is probably to try to figure out why you're doing it and how you're doing it, but that's going to take a long time. The simplest way is to create space and to create time and like Gene just said here, to walk away just when you wreck, but you have to recognize it. You have to recognize when you're really angry and really upset and then just step back, step out and cool off until you can think about it. Because when you're angry and you become really impulsive and if you've been drinking or doing any type of drugs, your risks are going to go up a lot. Yeah. Um, Yes, Nathan. So that was the answer to your question of when a man actually does break a barrier of laying the hands on a woman, how does he prevent himself from doing it again? And it's a process and right. So while that process is going on, you've got to walk away while you right. get some the separate simple answer is just try to get out, get out of the situation. If you're feeling angry, get out. You have to stop the abuse from occurring again if you want to rebuild trust in your relationship. So uh, you can do it. It's possible, but it's, it's, you know, it's not easy. Right. And seek out professional help about it. Um, yeah. outside of the family, outside of family and friends to seek that professional help. So then, okay, let's end on this then, because that brings us full circle to something in the Gabby Petito case from the very beginning. That was really important. One thing that Brian Laundry was saying during that video is I was trying to get space. I was trying to get space in the Police officers seem to understand that because that is a valuable thing for an abuser to do is to try to get space. If someone wants is going to abuse someone, then they need to walk away. I think the difference there is he was trying to force Gabby. He was, in my opinion, he wasn't walking away. Brian was not walking away. He was right. taking her phone and locking her out of her own vehicle. Yeah. That's not walking away. Can you explain right. the difference? So that's what... Brian Laundry called walking away, but that was not what time out and walking away and having space is. Right. That, that the way that should have looked potentially is when they had the fight in the van, he locked her out of the van. He took her phone. He was trying to control her more. What he should have done, I think was say to her, look, I'm getting really angry. I don't like this fight. I don't like this argument. I'm just going to take some time. I'm going to go get something to drink. They were near, weren't they near like a little cafe or something? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go get something to eat. I'm just going to cool off. So, you know, feel free to do what, whatever you need to do. I'll be back in 15 minutes or something like that, right? Like the, what he did instead was he took control of the situation and he tried to dictate what she could and couldn't do. Right. Right. Well said. So thanks for explaining that difference because that's also something abusers can say to a woman too. Um, calm down. You're acting crazy. We just need space. Calm down. Stop, stop, stop. You know, they can go and do their time out and walk away. It has nothing to do with what the abuser is doing. So abuser and a, an abused is doing. So thank you. Thank you. I hope that I shared I'm not the psychologist here. So I hope I explained that last part. Well, I'm a little concerned I didn't. So if you need to clarify anything I just said, babe, before we end, I might let you have the last words. Well, I'm just looking at this comment about forgiving oneself. And yes, I think that's really critical. I think that if you look at the Brian Laundry letter, suicide note, you see that he didn't really do much of that, that he was very self punitive and, um, He's talking about animals tearing himself, tearing them apart. He's um, he's making comments that indicate that um, you know that he's insecure. Um, I don't think Brian Laundry ever really got to that point. So yes, that's I think that's really important. There's a lot of shame involved in abuse of all kinds, whether it's the perpetrator or the victim. And so I think dealing with that shame and having some capacity for self acceptance. And self-forgiveness is, is really important. Nathan says, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're really grateful for you. Even me. I learn a lot. I love picking your brain. Uh, John and I fell in love over phone calls. 
We were set up by a cousin. And uh, I think that many can understand why I just was able to talk to him and ask him my questions. And now I get to do that as our family business. So thanks for being here tonight and um, yep, for all you welcome. share. And thank you everyone for being here as well. And please, if you like what you heard, subscribe and hit that like button and let people know about John's assessment of Brian Laundrie's letter. And John, thank you for being here tonight. Yep, thank you. Thank we you got everyone a babysitter. For, so it works. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I appreciate you guys. The hidden gems. Thank you. Yes, the hidden gems. We'll see you. Good night. Thank you.